When you meditate, you've got to put the mind in the right mood. And sometimes focusing on the breath is the way to put it in the right mood. You take a couple of long, deep in and out breaths, and it feels good. You can just feel the stress and the strain melting away. The patterns of tension you've been holding in your body can begin to dissolve. There's a sense of nourishment that comes from that. And so you just drink it in. If after all long breathing doesn't feel good, you can try different rhythms. Short in, long out, or long in, short out, or shorter breathing, more shallow, lighter, heavier. You got to explore this area that they call form, the way you feel the body from within. And sometimes that's enough to get the mind to settle down. Other times you need to think about other things first in order to get in the right mood. The Buddha talks about gladdening the mind, steadying the mind, and releasing the mind. And these are all ways of taking a mind that's a little bit out of balance and bringing it back into balance. Or taking a mind that doesn't feel like meditating and refuses to stay with the breath and get it so that it's more willing. So it finally decides that, yes, it really does want to stay with the breath, because this element of desire is an important part of the meditation. It's an important part of the practice. It's an essential element in right effort. So it's not the case that the Buddha said that all desire is bad. The desire to develop the right factors of the path and to abandon the wrong factors, that's actually part of the path itself. It's a good way to get the mind willing and happy to settle down with the breath. You have to look at the mind and see what it needs. Sometimes it needs gladdening. In other words, you have to raise your energy level. And also look at the positive side of meditating. This is one of the reasons why we have those chants on goodwill before we meditate. Because you realize that when you meditate, you really are showing goodwill to yourself, and at the same time you're showing goodwill to others. You're looking for a form of happiness that doesn't take anything away from anyone else. At the same time, you're looking for a form of happiness that you can depend on, because it doesn't have to depend on anyone else. It comes from your own inner resources. And that form of happiness is a special sense of security. It's like knowing you have plenty of food stored away, plenty of water, all the things you need. That's a lot better than having to depend on people outside or things outside being a certain way. As we look at the world, it very rarely stays a certain way. Sometimes there's too much rain, sometimes there's not enough rain, sometimes there's huge fires and earthquakes. Right now there are floods in Thailand. We're sitting up here on the mountain thinking, well, at least we're not going to be flooded, but we do have fires here, we do have earthquakes. No matter where you look in the world, there's always natural d danger. And of course, then there's the dangers that come from a mind that hasn't been trained. But as we're working on training the mind here, we're finding a source of happiness that doesn't have to be touched by things outside. doesn't have to depend on things outside. We're a lot more secure. And at the same time, as you develop that happiness, it's not a selfish thing. You find that you have more to share with others, you have more strength to give. So these, these are some of the ways of gladdening the mind. So you see the positive side of the meditation. Then there's the process of steadying the mind. And that has more to do with seeing the negative results of not meditating. In other words, you realize that if you let the mind wander outside, you're wandering in dangerous territory. 
The Buddha gives the image of a monkey that goes into an area where the human beings are. And it turns out the human beings have set out traps for the monkeys. They put out little patches of tar. The monkeys get stuck on the tar and they can't go away, can't get away. Or there's a story of the quail that wanders away from its normal territory, which is a field where clods of earth and stones have been plowed up, where it can hide from hawks while it wanders away into an area that hasn't been plowed, and sure enough, a hawk comes down and gets it. So those are the dangers of not staying with your frame of reference, which right now is the body in and of itself, the breath coming in and going out. You think of all the trouble you can get yourself into if you don't train your mind. You start thinking about the pleasures you would like to have. And John Fung once made a comment. He said, the pleasures you're really going for, especially the sensual pleasures, the ones that really have a strong impact on you. Why do they have that impact? It's because you had them in the past and you want them back. Whether it was this lifetime or another lifetime, there's something inside you that really gets drawn to the things you used to have. But of course, what does that mean? You're going to lose them again, and you're going to hunger for them again. It goes around and around and around, and you know the kinds of stupid and crazy and harmful things you can do sometimes under the influence of that kind of desire. So that kind of thought is chastening. Or as in that chant we had just now, the world is swept away, it does not endure, it offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. The world has nothing of its own, one has to pass on, leaving everything behind. It's insufficient, insatiable, a slave to craving. It's full of inconstancy, stress, pain, not self. And craving keeps driving you back to these things again and again and again. There's never a sense of enough. There's that story of the king and the canon, who was curious, what does it mean the world is a slave to craving? And the monk who's teaching him says, well, suppose someone were to come to, from the east and say there's a kingdom to the east full of all kinds of treasures, all kinds of wealth. It's prop prosperous, but its army is weak, and you could conquer it if, if you wanted to. Would you conquer it? And here the king, who's 80 years old already, said, sure, I'd try to conquer it and rule it. Suppose there are another man from coming from the south, and there's another kingdom like that to the south. It turns out there's one from the west and one from the north. Would you try to conquer those as well? Of course. Suppose there were to be someone come from the other side of the ocean saying there's a kingdom over there that you could conquer. Go for that one too. In other words, the mind has no sense of enough when it comes to sensual pleasures, when it comes to power, because there never really is enough. None of this stuff is secure. There's another story of a former king who was a monk who would go and sit under a tree and say, what bliss, what bliss, and the other monks were concerned that he was missing his pleasures as a king. So they go and inform the Buddha. The Buddha asks for the monk to come and see him, and he asks him, what do you have in mind when you're saying this? The monk says, well, back when I was a king, even though I had guards posted inside and outside the palace, inside and outside the city, inside and outside the countryside, still at night I couldn't sleep for fear that someone would come and take my life and take my power away. In other words, that kind of happiness has no safety at all. So when your mind is prowling around in those kinds of thoughts, you have to realize you're in unsafe territory. And that kind of thought is chastening. It gives rise to what the Buddha calls sangwega. literally means terror. But it also means a sense of dismay over how futile those kinds of pleasures are. Or that kind of thinking that goes after those pleasures is just going to get you into a lot of trouble. That helps to steady the mind. So you realize there's nowhere else you want to go. You want to stay right here. John Mahabua compares these teachings to a stick that you use to train a monkey. As soon as the monkey reaches for something, you hit it with a stick. 
That's why you, in the same way you hit the mind with these teachings. So as soon as it wanders away from the breath, bang. You realize you're looking for trouble. You come right back. So in these ways you look at the positive side of the, how good it is to meditate, and you look at the negative side of how bad your life could get if you don't meditate. They've done studies of people who develop skills, and they've discovered the ones who are really proficient at particular skills are the ones who see, on the one hand, the benefits, really take to heart the benefits of developing that skill and the dangers of not developing it, the harm you can do. Years back, we were sitting on a pl plane, and there were two knee surgeons sitting in seats in front of us. They'd just come from a conference. There was an older surgeon and a younger one. And the younger one had just recently graduated from school, and his attitude was, well, I've learned all I really need in order to take care of me for the rest of my life. I don't really have to need, need to learn much more. And the older one said, no, you can't think like that at all. There's always advances, and there's so many things that you can do wrong to people's knees if you don't really take care and do your best. The other one didn't seem to be receptive, and I kept thinking, just keep me away from that surgeon. People don't realize the harm they can do to themselves and to other people. They're really dangerous. So these are ways that you gladden the mind. You realize that the meditation really does provide a way out, and it's a good way out, too. It's not that it's filled with thorns and brambles and other things in the path. It's a good path. You get to sit here and focus on your breath, work with the breath energy in the body so that it nourishes the body and nourishes the mind, so the mind has a greater sense of well-being. Even as you're on the way, even though you haven't reached the end, you're, you can still develop a very strong sense of well-being, just being on the path. And then you steady the mind by realizing that if you wander off the path even a little bit, the hawk can come and get you. These cravings of yours that wander away. They can keep you going with that end. So when you can develop both of these attitudes, you find that it's a lot easier to stay with the breath. And the more consistently you can stay with the breath and be observant about what you're doing, the more momentum you build up in the path. And it's not just a series of starts and stops, starts and stops. It becomes more continuous. It flows. So try to keep these right attitudes in mind.